Um, welcome to Slowing Research, Reflecting on Theories of Change uh, with Drs. Denise Taliaferro oh, Basile, Alexis Shotwell, and Shaista Patel. My name is Suzanne McCullough, Assistant Professor in Philosophy at Athabasca University, and I'll be moderating today's event with my colleague, Dr. Katie McDonald, Assistant Professor of Sociology, and together we're representing a joint collaboration between the J-Series and the Faculty of Humanities and Social Science Research Talks. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, so often when I open uh, events or meetings with land acknowledgements, I try to speak both to where I currently make my home and am a visitor and a settler on Treaty 6 territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, and Nakota Sioux and Métis Nation 4, as well as Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory and traditional homeland of the Mi'kmaq Nation, where I grew up as a visitor and a settler, and what still, still continues to feel like home to me. These two acknowledgements have felt distinct to me, a kind of here and there. As we talked in our organizing committee about our land acknowledgement today, we talked about water. We want to recognize the North Saskatchewan River, which is and has been present, present in each of our lives to the humans and non-humans that it supports and to the indigenous peoples that use and have been its stewards. I thought of the walks I sometimes take along the river here and how it is such a presence in Amasawasi with Hekin, um, or Edmonton. The North Saskatchewan flows both east and west from here, a way of travel that follows land and that gives both life, life to both many human and non-human animals. To the east, it empties into the colonial known Hudson Bay, and from there, the water flows through the St. Lawrence, which travels onto Mi'kma'ki. The waterways connect my here and there, and this tracing is a tracing of relation, of connection. These places, people, animals are connected in many ways, including by water. I am responsible to this water, much as these waterways have been responsible for providing life, connection, and so much more. I'd like to invite you to, to think of a waterway in your life here and now or then and there and how it has been present in your life and what might some of the responsibilities be that you have to it. And I'll just give you 30 seconds for that reflection. So as Suzanne said, this is a collaboration between J-Series and FHSS Research Talks, which is a series of talks in our faculty to share research and foster collegiality and a strong research culture. I'm on the organizing committee of FHSS Talks, along with my lovely colleagues, Dr. Nisha Nath and Dr. Kristen Rodier. Our theme this year is theories of change in research. And for folks here who are in FHSS, we have one spot left in our next session, and we will be recirculating our call later this week. So please consider submitting a proposal or sharing with colleagues who you think would be interested. Um, the Justice Webinar and Speaker Series, what we call J-Series, hosts online events with scholars who address topics pertaining to social and transformative justice, anti-oppression, and equity. The primary goal of the J-Series is to increase capacities for justice broadly conceived throughout our community's research initiatives and teaching practices. I'm very lucky to work with my incredible colleagues, Dr. Nina Polovikova, Dr. Tobias Wiggins, and Priscilla McGreer in organizing these events. We are thankful to the support of the Athabasca Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, we have structured, I wanna say a bit about how today's event is structured. So we have structured today's event in a way that we'll first hear short talks from our speakers. And after they have all spoken, there will be a period of questioning and conversation amongst the speakers themselves. Uh, the circle of conversation will then expand to involve a circle of respondents. The respondents will pose questions that are informed by their reading of one of the speaker's texts. We will then open to questions from the audience and you may type these into the chat box during the question period and Dr. McDonald or I will read them out loud. So our intention with this structure is to experiment with models of thoughtful questioning that deepen engagement with the work of the speakers and the theme of the talks. The idea for this circle formation uh, grows out of conversations with Maria Campbell, Priscilla Campo, and Ivy Lalonde of the Naskatchewan Center. We are thankful to them 
for spending time with us, imagining how to nurture more reciprocal relations in online spaces, and for sharing with us the idea of working with circles of speakers and respondents. We are grateful to the vision, ethics, and actions outlined in the Saskatchewan, in the Saskatchewan plan that articulates our commitment to move Indigenous knowledge into the mainstream of university culture. I now have the pleasure of introducing our three incredible speakers today. Um, so I'll introduce all three of them and then we'll move into the speaker portion of our session. So our first speaker is Denise Taliferro Basil, whose work focuses on understanding curriculum as racial gendered text with an emphasis on disrupting traditional modes of knowledge production, validation, and representation. She is Associate Dean of Diversity and Student Experience and Professor of Curriculum and Cultural Studies in the Department of Educational Leadership at Miami University. She has published in numerous curriculum and education journals and is co-editor of Race, Gender, and Curriculum, Theor Theorizing, Wom Theorizing Womenish Ways and Black Women Theorizing Curriculum Studies in Color and Curves. Our second speaker is Alexis Shotwell, whose work focuses on complexity, complicity, and collective transformation. A professor in sociology and anthropology, she is the co-investigator for the AIDS Activist History Project and the author of Knowing Otherwise, Race, Gender, and Implicit Understanding, and Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Time. Our third speaker is Shaista Aziz Patel, who identifies as a Pakistani Shi Muslim scholar and does interdisciplinary work addressing questions of multiple colonialisms, caste, race, and Muslimness. She works as Assistant Professor of Critical Muslim Studies at University of California, San Diego. And we'll begin with Denise. Denise? Great, thank you. Good afternoon, um, everyone. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Niamia people um, who uh, we are actually celebrating at the university this year, Miami of Ohio. We are celebrating 50 year relationship with the Miamia tribe and their, um, their really important work that sits on our campus, but um, is uh, directed by, um, by the tribe. Um, uh, from uh, Oklahoma. So um, I just wanted to recognize that before jumping in to um, my comments. And so uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation um, to speak on this topic. Um, I think it is a very compelling um, topic. Um, and thanks to Eve's, uh, uh, Dr. Tux's uh, wonderful um, and thought provoking and always deeply engaged in thinking about the issues that that um, push us that call us back to thinking about uh, you know the value uh, uh, and the ethics of the work that we are or are not doing. Um, and so um, I I will say I want to start by saying I do not think that I do research in any traditional way, um, uh, especially in the field of education and in the field of curriculum studies. Um, uh, education, I, you know, sometimes I feel like I just don't belong in the space because it is so very driven by social science uh, research. And I don't, um, I don't think that's what I do. And that I don't, have I am not making any kind of value judgment on research writ large, but I'm just saying for me, uh, the work that I uh, do as a scholar uh, is not social science research. And this might it, this has to do with a lot of things. One, I would say, before coming back to education and into ac academia at the graduate level, I worked in television news. Um, um, for several years. Uh, and so certainly that has a thing. I have a thing about that. And one of the things I struggled with in television news is um, our sometimes very, what I would consider a very disrespectful engagement with the community or our representations uh, of the community. So, um, so I thought, let me get out of television news and get back to the sanity of the classroom uh, uh, in the university. But of course there, I, you know, there are some uh, things that trouble me about the way we think about and do uh, research in academia. And so most of my work 
has actually um, focused on one, two, maybe two ways of thinking about change. And one certainly to me in my mind is that, you know, all of my sociology friends talk about the systems and the institutions, which I absolutely think need to be highlighted. But uh, I also think to myself all the time that those things are made up of people. And if people um, aren't uh, changing or engaged in the constant, you know, uh, thinking through of, you know, who they are in the world and how they are in the world and how they are in relationship to other people, then um, I don't know how we make these grand changes that need to be made systemically and institutionally and structurally um, without um, doing the work as individual people. So I think that's hugely important. And I also would say that I grew up in the context of a very politically active, some would say radical family context, um, where we were always involved in organizing and movement building and, um, you know, trying to make a way, sometimes out of no way, in the context of a quickly deindustrializing urban city that for my entire life, probably people would say uh, was in decline. And so, um, uh, and so the collective is hugely important in the work. So it, there is the self-self and then there is the self in relationship to uh, the collective that I think is hugely important when we think about change. And I don't know any, like, I think sometimes we're under this illusion that it's the people in, you know, it's the policymakers who are actually making the change. It's a, and I don't think any of those things get revved up without first the individual and then the collective demanding what they needed to what they need to demand to make that uh, change happen. And I don't, I haven't seen it any other way. And you know, um, the the so I think it's is hugely important to always be thinking about these dynamics. And I think what's happened in the academy largely is that there's this research over here that looks at systems and institutions. And then there's this other stuff over here that sometimes is not looked at <laughs> at all <laughs> as valuable, um, where we're uh, really trying to interrogate the self in relationship uh, in, in relationship to the self itself, in relationship to those, uh, the people who we do not, not, not necessarily uh, know yet, um, uh, and our relationship to the institution writ large and the structural and the structures. Um, and so for me, this, so there's one quote that drives me in my own work, and it's um, uh, education will change the world, and self-education will change, will transform education. And so, you know, that's to me what's guided the work that I've done. So I try to um, a lot of my work is, I would say, critical, reflective um, work, uh, and that does not mean it is narcissistic. That does not mean <laughs> it does not deal and engage with uh, theory, and it does not mean that it does not make space to bring in, uh, you know, so many other voices that have impacted um, my own uh, growing in development, um, and so you know, that's the way I think about the work um, uh, that I do. It is, it starts with questioning myself and, uh, and then and questioning the things that are around me. Um, and, uh, and it, and it, and it, it speaks to, and sometimes relies on all the other research that my colleagues are um, doing. And so I have this, I don't know what to, whether I have something um, really clear to say about those tensions, 
of, you know, not wanting to be the person uh, engaged in, you know, the research that to me, no matter how much we try not to make people feel like objects, kind of the way the enterprise is set up in the deepest roots of the academy is to define distance and dominate. And I, I feel that, um, you know, very much so. Um, and, and yet at the same time, there's the whole question of, you know, you know, uh, what the things that we have to do <laughs> to be in academia. And so I've skirted somewhere um, in between that, engaging social science research by using the work of my colleagues, um, but not being comfortable in doing the work um, and doing that work myself and uh, instead focusing on the work, I think, um, in a way that I'm continually growing. Um, as a, as a scholar, as an activist, as an educator, um, thinking deeply about all these things uh, uh, around me and often thinking deeply with the people, um, but not wanting to be in the position of doing research, objectifying, looking for things, th th those kinds of things um, have not been a comfortable space for me. How much more time? Like I forgot to. That's that's great. You have ten seconds, so it's oh okay. Oh, oh, yes. Well, damn, I'm <laughs> dropping <the> mic. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, so now I'd like to invite our second speaker, Alexis Shotwell. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you, Denise. That was really. Um, such a wonderful starting point and thanks to all of the organizers for creating this space and inviting us into it. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm beaming in from Algonquin care land in Ottawa, Ontario, the heart of uh, the colonial uh, recipiation of extractivism. And as I was trying to think about um, what I wanted to say today, I shared some, um, I shared a piece of writing for the, the sort of organizers about epistemic extractivism and what it means for us to form pedagogical relations that reject or that help us retrain that impulse that is uh, encoded and, and built in to our schooling structure and I'm happy to talk more about that and maybe in conversation we'll talk more about it but as I thought about trying to sort of like just give that argument here I thought it's not actually very useful and I'm happy to just send you the draft uh, chapter if you're interested in it what I thought I would do here um, is really take this invitation um, to reflect on and think through what it means to slow research um, and just try to share some of the things that I have unevenly um, come to um, in case any of it is useful. So this is kind of in the in the mode of um, like one of my mentors, Sue Campbell, when she was quite ill, uh, said to me, I really want you to not, um, I really would like you to not die because of the job. And she said, I feel sort of bad that I helped you get an academic job because I see you working at it in the way that I have worked at it. And she said, I know that it's not the job's fault that I got cancer, but I don't think it helped. Mm -hmm. um, so then I proceeded to spend like the last 15 years, just really not listening to that advice at all. And so a little bit here when I'm calling in relations of responsibility in terms of being a uh, settler, you know, full professor at a pretty stable university, having formerly taught at Laurentian University, which just got gutted by the Ford government and the department that I was in evacuated, you know, canceled, destroyed. Um, I've really been thinking about like why I, who has the most, um, you know, the most stability that you can have really uh, couldn't 
do enact this in, imperative from my mentor to not overwork. Um, and the way that that refusal to enact her imperative and even try that um, came out of my wish to do good research that was of benefit to people. Um, and the way that we overwork ourselves when we care about the world and when we are movement people trying to be involved with the university. So I came to sort of three, um, three things, all of which do connect with the piece that many of us have read, um, Biting the University That Feeds Us. Uh, and I, they're trying to lift up and do some honor to Sue Campbell, who I didn't listen to, um, but also genuinely I thought, what could I say that maybe would be useful to you? Um, assuming that many of you are in some way connected to the academy and doing research here. Um, so the first one is, I think that it's helpful for us to really be um, very careful to not lie to ourselves about what we're doing. Um, recently been writing about Jean-Paul Sartre's conception of bad faith, and I went back and reread Being in Nothingness. And he talks about this, this thing, bad faith. Um, and I had forgotten that he defines it as basically lying to yourself, which is an, an impossible thing to do because it's you, you know the truth, but you kind of turn away from it and cover it up. So a lot of us who care about the world or are engaged in movements or trying to do research that can be a weapon in the hands of the oppressed. Um, sometimes what we're, at, what we're doing is trying to get a job or keep a job. Uh, but we say that what we're trying to do is research that is research in the hands of the oppressed. So I'm interested in, or I'm finding it helpful to be very clear and deliberate about when we are actually doing something that's for people, for movements, for change, and when we're doing something that is so that we can have a job. And I would like us to think about jobs, including the job of teaching, of being a professor, of being a researcher, I would like us to think about jobs as morally neutral. So that it doesn't, it doesn't mean any particular thing that we have this job or that we don't get this job, but that actually we're, um, it's just work that we're doing. Um, so that might mean in terms of our actual research practice that we say, in order to keep this job, I need to publish these things in these sites. Um, and that's okay. Like that's just, that's part of the dictate of the job, but that you be very honest about saying, and that is not serving, you know, whoever the people are that you're working with or uh, for necessarily, that there's things that you do, that you're just trying to intervene in a particular academic conversation or, you need to meet some, um, some particular criteria for the institution that you work in. Um, so if the job's morally neutral, what you do with the job is what makes a difference. And so if you approach your research with the idea that everything you're doing is benefiting someone oppressed, it's probably not true. Um, and you're probably gonna have to have a, a sort of twisting quality so that you also can get the publication out of it. So that's my first sort of like thing. What happens if we just don't lie about that, which I think involves demoralizing um, and in including de-guiltifying being in the privileged position of doing university labor. Um, the other piece about making something a job is that uh, then it's a place for organizing. So we can collectively work to make the things that we're doing different and better. So then second, second and third are much shorter. The second one is if what we're doing is morally neutral, how we do it matters a lot. And so we can be asking, are we in relations of domination and extraction, um, including with ourselves? Are we, um, are we behaving toward ourselves in a way that we do not think people should be behaved toward? Are we, um, are we overworking? Are we, uh, sort of flogging ourselves on, um, what would it mean for us not to behave like that? Or in my experience, 
when I've acknowledged that that's what I'm doing, I can see that then I am also not being in good relation with my graduate students, with people that I'm waiting for, you know, their readers reports back for a special issue that I'm editing, all of those things, right? Like, what does it mean for me to do the job in a way that actually can be caring and kind, including to myself? Um, I think if we're going to really talk about slowing research, that's part of it. I have a wonderful graduate student, Colleen Young, who's working on the question of crip time and disability pacing and how we train graduate students. And because of her work, I'm thinking a lot about this um, even more, although it's always been clear to me that the speed up involved in the neoliberalization of the institution is grinding grad students up now in a way that it didn't even 20 years ago when I was going through. So then finally, I feel when we're thinking about um, some of the provocations in this biting, biting the university that feeds us, we have to ask, what are we doing outside of our job? Um, what organizing are we involved in that has nothing to do with academia and that we are in no way trying to transform and make fungible and palatable and consumable by the university. I feel like we need to carve out spaces where we are not doing research for the institution at all. And that that can produce something for us that we can't quite predict. But in my experience, it's the only thing that really keeps us going. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Alexa. Um, so now I'd like to invite our third speaker, Shaista Aziz Patel. Thanks, Shaista. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I do see some of my students here and I know what they are thinking. I know folks what you're thinking that she still didn't brush her hair today either. Um, I will brush my hair for the final class, okay? Um, so I have a PowerPoint and I hope it's okay um, if I share that, just so you know you don't have to I always say to my students as a joke so that you don't have to look at my face, but I actually mean it. Okay, so um, now the proper, uh, you know, sort of beginning with uh, just wishing you all good afternoon. And to say that I would like to thank Dr. Katie McDonald, Susan, uh, Dr. Susan McCullough and Dr. Nisha Nath for inviting me to join this conversation and so many people, including Tobias Wiggins, who made this possible. Um, of course, my co-presenters, Denise and Alexis as well. And also a huge thank you to Dr. Melissa Jay, the respondent for our, that is I and my co-author, Dia Da Costa, who's also here in the audience, um, our almost 14,000 word article on collaborations across caste lines. Um, you know, that article should have released by now, um, but it has unfortunately become one of those ominous articles that are produced or published only once the authors are dead, but we still have hope that it will be published in our lifetime. Um, so I also want to acknowledge the Kumeyaay peoples whose lands my university sits on. However, my school is so extremely anti-Indigenous. University of California, San Diego is so extremely anti-Indigenous that the Kumeyaay peoples have issued a directive, um, uh, you know, during the pandemic asking my employer to stop doing the land acknowledgement that still plays on and desires the dead Indian trope. Okay, so long before I explicitly put it this way, I have been asking myself what my vision is for Dalit and Muslim feminisms and solidarities. Living constantly with ideological and epistemic violence where I had to hide one or the other part of my identity so that academics in particular could make sense of me I now feel very relieved and fortunate to identify myself as both Dalit and Muslim and say um, that the epistemologies driving from my histories have guided all my work to date, whether it's on complicity of South Asians in multiple colonialisms, tracing caste-based histories of my own family or my work related to politics and ethics of research. Before I make a few points from that article, um, especially on the theory of change driving that discussion, I want to quickly explain what caste is. So as you can see um, on my screen, this pyramid, um, you know, and you can see from this pyramid that caste is a hierarchical of organizing life, much like race. 
cost is, and this is something extremely important that I keep seeing again and again, you know, cost is one of the first structures of incarceration. And, you know, it is a 2,500 year old structure of dehumanization whereby people are divided into a vertical hierarchy of four caste groups with thousands of subcastes in each caste group. And outside the caste system are Adivasis, who are the indigenous peoples of India, and Dalits, who were previously pejoratively known as untouchables. These are people outside the caste system and subject to over two millennia of dehumanizing violence by people who belong to dominant castes, which are the top three castes of Brahmin, Kshatriya, and Vaishyas. And at the bottom are the Shudras, which are also known as Bahujan, Bahu meaning many, and Jan meaning people. So many people, most of India's people are Shudra, are from the Shudra caste. So, you know, at this point, I often see non-South Asians losing interest um, and thinking this is not about us. But, you know, what is really important for me, for us, for Dia and I, is to make it clear that caste is not a South Asian problem, which we brown people have to deal with among ourselves. Dia da Costa, and I make it clear in our article that it is not lateral violence. Caste is necessarily a vertical hierarchy of dehumanization. We, Dia as a Brahmin scholar and I as a Dalit Muslim scholar, we could not understand the limits of cross-caste collaborations even between the two of us without understanding the preordained inequalities actively reproduced within material social relations and knowledge production through millennia within and beyond South Asia. So we initially came together because we wanted to write about our complicity in white settler colonialism. And we, you know, this figure of the settler of color broke into so many different, like, you know, it, it just, it broke into so many little pieces once we centered race and we were like, we cannot write about our complicity together, even though we are the same skin color and, and South Asian. Okay, so for those of us whose identities and complexities of histories are not easily legible in academia, we have to do this background work like I just did with explaining what caste is. I now turn to um, Dr. So, okay, so this is just another book that is really popular. It came out last year uh, with a black scholar engaging with question of caste and race. Um, and again, I just want to say caste is not class. If you hear, you know, Brahmin people crying that my parents came in with $5 while my came in as enslaved people, so whatever. Okay, so theories of change. I now turn to Dr. Tuck's words, and I just want to say a side note, because I am so always showing off this, that uh, I was Dr. Eve Tuck's first ever graduate student. Um, I did my PhD with her, and it's an honor attached to my soul. So um, everything that I have, I, I owe it to her training. Okay. So Dr. Eve Tuck says, and I quote her here, that theory of change refers to beliefs or assumptions about how social change happens, is prompted or is influenced, end of quote. I have been thinking with her words about the purpose of collaborations by academics, especially now in the era of all these seemingly radical productions under the guise of dissident friendships and theorizing of interdisciplinarity as joining the streets to the classrooms where universities still remain as much a place of mystique to working class indigenous black and particular kinds of racialized people as they were always meant to be. So it's easy to cite Angela Davis here, but you know, to actually do the work and slow down, that's a difficult task. So the title of this event is Slowing Research, and I'm advocating for that, but I don't mean it in a patronizing no realities of Black, racialized, and Indigenous academics recognized or accounted for um, on how we have to do, we have to work harder, so much harder at our teaching, research, and service work than our white colleagues. But the ask for slowing down is directed at white and dominant caste scholars and it had asked to be ethical, to be really, really ethical and visionary and not predatory in a way that you can feel it in your heart. For many academic collaborations is a grant, another project, another line on our CVs. And over the years, I have been dismayed by what becomes of the communities brought into these projects. Okay, so in this article, Dia and I particularly looked at some publications of dominant caste scholars who have made their careers writing books that are heavily circulated here, 
in North American Academy, such as Richa Nagar's 2006 much celebrated book of feminist commitment to freedom, reciprocity, and solidarity called Playing with Fire, Feminist Thought and Activism Through Seven Lives in India, which she co-wrote with eight other grassroots activists from mostly rural and a variety of caste and class locations in Uttar Pradesh, India. Through, look, through looking at this text, but not just this text alone, we outlined how in collaborations across caste lines, often Dalits and the caste oppressed and Adivasi tribal indigenous peoples of India remain as mere data. We did not write this article to accuse authors and stayed away from predatory citational practices. Lots of care was taken into writing this text and hopefully some of you will get to, you know, will be interested enough to read it if it ever gets published. Okay. So in, in, in case of uh, Richa Nagar's book, Dia de Costa powerfully exposes the power that hides behind this blended we of collaboration, you know, so I have the actual quote from Richa Nagar on the screen. And I'm going to read the sentence again. So Dia powerfully exposes the power that hides behind this blended way of collaboration. And she notes how, especially in a book where the cost locations of rural women mark the lives of others, and in quite totalizing ways, caste does not seem to over-determine the lives of the dominant caste academics like Richa Nagar. And we find it extremely, extremely problematic and for me, extremely sad reading that book. While their slash our as in Dalit lives are laid out for the reader to probe at, dominant caste collaborators get to stay on the relative sidelines, affording them the mystification of irrelevance, privacy, respectability, distance, and therefore greater value than those whose lives are made public to the reader in the name of collaboration and friendship across the lines of academia and marginalized community. So we wrote together to encourage South Asian academics to think critically about what remains unsaid and becomes epistemological and material violence in this encounter of what we are calling Brahmin patronage and Dalit death, something you know, we talk about in, in more detail in our article. So this transaction of debt and patronage continues the costest project of humiliation and dehumanization of caste oppressed people. For us, that is for Dia and I, this difficult work of thinking through caste hierarchies and our investments in either upholding or working towards the Dalit feminist project of caste annihilation is both urgent and the only way we can enter into conversations on decolonization and abolition in North America. One more minute, okay. So instead of intending a prescriptive article on how to do collaborative work, we hope that our transparency in this piece can encourage the reader to pause, question, and maybe even resist the imperiling seduction of doing collaborative research without writing in one's complicity or clear goals working across power lines in academia. While writing this article, we have found ourselves asking about the most productive ways to challenge the circulation of collaborations across difference as a radical praxis of interdisciplinarity in academia. Collaborative work is, of course, already exemplified in a long history of Indigenous Black Latinx writing that did not live along the binaries of academia and taking to the streets. The more recent phenomenon of making collaborative scholarship commonplace is also a welcome sign of a hard-won struggle on the part of those feminists whose interdisciplinary, whose interdisciplinary work brought text and context into a continuum with the streets and academia. These women and non-binary thinkers amplified the testimonials of indigenous Black, Latinx, and other women and non-binary people transnationally and helped make poly polyvocal knowledge production matter in the academy for challenging prevailing canons and encouraging critical thinking and social change. These feminist scholars taught us how to pay attention to not just what we know, but more importantly, how we know. It is this practice which has guided our collaborative writing on why we cannot write about our complicity in holding up white settler colonialism across caste lives. I end with this last slide, um, you know, that has the words of powerful words of Adiwasi scholar Abe Kaka, who was taken from us way too soon in his early 40s only, which is the reality of so many Adivasi scholars in India who are constantly fighting, uh, you know, India as a Brahminical state. We don't think of India as a democracy or anything like that. 
So, um, so you know, Abed Kaka wrote, I am not your data, nor am I your vote bank. I am not your project or any exotic museum project. I am not the soul waiting to be harvested, nor am I the lab where your theories are tested. And we can talk more about class, but there's also a class survey um, if you're interested. I will stop my screen share now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha. Um, thank you, Drs. Talasvaro Basil, Dr. Shotwell, and Patel for these rich reflections on research. Um, I'm going to invite you now to pose questions and have a conversation with one another, and we have about 18 minutes for that conversation. Um, so we'll just open up the floor and you can engage with each other. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for this, those, I think, very um, thought-provoking um, comments. I, I'm really, I think we're all proposing some, some things that are really both, you know, outside of the scope of um, academia, a really kind of undoing, I think, um, of, of academia um, at its root. And so <clears throat> I'm wondering how we, I know I struggle a lot with trying to really come fully with good faith um, in my community spaces and in my classroom spaces uh, with with this kind of sort of interrogation of you know, um, you know, academia is 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 you know in part this thing that we um, that brings us to these spaces and to these conversations, but that in also in some very violent ways um, and certainly invested in 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 uh, empire, and so I always find myself struggling to engage my students really thoughtfully in those discussions, but also, again, trying to be aware of the things that they need to know to survive. And so I'm curious about how you all, you know, um, you know, take up these um, concerns, you know, with your, with your students in particular. Alexis, would you, you like to go first? Yeah. Do you want to go ahead? No, no, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I was thinking that too. And um, I'm, well, this happens to me a lot that I have, like yesterday, I was meeting with a student who's in my social justice in action third year class. And, um, and they said something that students say to me a lot that makes me feel really worried, uh, which was, they said, I don't know how to go on now that I know all these things mm -hmm. that I'm learning in this class. The class is about movements in Ottawa, but it focuses on abolition, prison abolition and policing abolition. And, um, you know, and that's often a feeling that that people have, that the, ta the task is just to know more. And the more you know, the less you can do. And especially the more you recognize the ways that you're implicated in oppression, um, the, you know, the more you just should just learn more things and um, not do anything. So um, I feel like part of the antidote for that for me has been first really just recognizing that we're part of a long-term de-skilling of just basic being in collectivities that are not hierarchically organized. And so that part of what we can do is, as part of our pedagogy is build out some of the that work of what does it mean to learn how to be together in collectivities um, because it that's the thing that you know we actually do we can teach that that's something that we can help and for me part of it has been coming to a place where I really feel very I thoroughly understand how fucked the university is like how fucked it is and how fucked up it is mm -hmm. and therefore, I'm, I want to be able to stand with the vision of the university that actually um, 
is also an incubator for contingent, imperfect possibility for liberations. So not the only place in North America we really have this such a, a gap of any intellectual space that isn't in universities. So we need to proliferate those and like, how can we do that as teachers too? But also I feel a little bit done with just stopping with saying how fucked up the university is. And I feel interested in saying like, why is it fucked? Like, why are the, why do conservatives continue to attack the university when I know that it's not the bastion of radicalism? So like, how do we make it the bastion of radicalism, you know, or how do we, how do we find some of those spaces where it still is a danger? So I want us to bite the university that feeds us. And also I want it, I want to continue to use the spaces we have that can make us become more dangerous to capitalism and colonialism. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you, Denise, for posing that question. And also Alexis, you had said something about, you know, what are we doing outside of our jobs? I'm just, you know, I'm writing something now called What About Collegiality? Because, you know, in the last one year when, you know, th this, when this was, you know, this is public knowledge now, there is an academic, a dominant caste, um, you know, racialized woman, Saiba Warma, who did extremely unethical research with Kashmiris, given that her father mm -hmm. was, you know, how we have CIA here, her father was the head of RAW, which is the Indian CIA, and she went wow. into psychiatry. And it's hit this knowledge from, hit this background from people and collected data uh, on the, you know, basically doing the work of occupation to see how Kashmiris are suffering with 84%, I think is the stats for how many Kashmiris, uh, you know, experience mental health concerns, given that it is the most brutally militarized zone in the whole yeah. world, in the entire planet. And, you know, people who teach about social justice. So there were the white cis male academics who are obsessed with Asia, who completely saw that, you know, if the blood is on Saiba's hands, the blood is also on our hands. And so they completely were with her because, you know, blood is on all their hands. I mean, it is in the, on the hands of most anthropologists and as a depart, as a field itself. But, you know, the issue was that when those women of color who were all about collegiality, who were all about, you know, can we work this out, were playing this trope of respectability politics while trying to do indigenous solidarity work or working with, you know, marginalized communities. Like what, you know, that kind of, thank you, Alexis, for saying the F word. Now we can say bullshit, you know, that kind of <laughs> bullshit there. It is, you know, we have projects, we are doing collaborations, but Kashmiris are not important with their 436 year old history of brutal colonial violence. Um, so, you know, it's okay, Saiba is a racialized woman. And that's why, you know, I think mm -hmm. the value, thinking about multiple colonialities and how white supremacy works in other spaces and caste is so important. So can I just take the space, you know, I know my students are here, they've heard me swear before, but fuck collegiality, fuck respectability politics, and, you know, burn down the university itself, like biting the university for me is not just going outside the university. I am too old now to take to the streets. I'm also tired and whatever, lazy now. But, you know, I mean, why can we not burn it down from within, you know, sitting in my office or living room? So that's what I want to say that, you know, these people talking about these collaborations are just so, uh, so enamored with collegiality and respectability and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually think it's a good point because I think there is no, as long as you're in it, no escape from it. And it makes me think all the way back to, um, I think it was Edward Said E's Representations of the Intellectual, and in, which I read early on as a graduate student and was thinking about how, like what I was about to enter <laughs> was about to be a sort of you know, socializing into a kind of silencing under the illusion that you're being less silenced and, you know, developing a voice. And so I just remember that, like, so starkly, that clarity is um, a, a graduate student about, you know, getting in this relation with the, um, with the academy. And, and so I do think, you know, even for just as a Black woman, period, <laughs> you, you know, the institution of schooling, whether it is K-12 or higher ed, is wholly problematic, um, I think, in so many, uh, so many ways. And so, like, I try to tell my own children all the time, don't let schooling hold your education hostage, because mm -hmm. it's almost like that is its purpose, 
is into some way, you know, hold it uh, hostage. And so, you know, I, I am curious, I like, I am so curious about this because I do think that like we see these dynamics as, as individuals and we're speaking out about them and we're working on them, you know, you know, through our own work. And I'm always pressing on like what it might mean if we all actually came together and, we, and we're doing the work um, collectively and across all of these complicated sort of interactions and differences. And I think we need we need something else we we need something that's beyond a radical commons. Maybe it's a, I, I've been calling it a commons not yet, because right now I, I feel like what happens is that we are together when our needs are intersecting. But if you look at that intersection, we continue to move <laughs> in cross uh, purposes. And, and, in, in, and in the belly of empire, you know, when, this is working for us, we're also necessarily, um, you know, settling, stealing, enslaving on, 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 uh, on other peoples. And so we're all implicated, um, I think, in the, the difficulties of it. But this idea that, you know, to me is very intimate, like, mm -hmm engaging this idea of working through self and working through collective rather than what we see a lot of which is you know sort of you know distancing ourselves to look at and call out the structures and systems but without necessarily committing to like living your life is revolutionary praxis. And that doesn't mean showing up at the protest every day necessarily, but it means like, what am I doing every day in this moment when I'm talking to these students, when I'm, you know, having to do something, you know, as an administrator that in my just deepest part of myself don't want to do, um, you know, so I, I don't know. I just think these are like, when I think about what next, I want to say, yeah, what what do we do collectively next to really make a significant impact? I just I just want to say, Denise, I really appreciate what you're saying. You know, for me, what I've seen is that collectives, you know, and, and collectivities are also genocidal. And, you know, I mean, for so many of us, our oppressions are not even legible. And so we spend our whole lives or, you know, the 10 minute talk that we have, like we spend uh, three and a half minutes explaining who we are, like, you know, sort of in a nutshell. And so I just, I, you know, I, I appreciate the hope that you have, but I am more so with your, you know, where the grad students are for both of you thinking like, what am I going to do? And I often joke that, you know, I, I miss my chance of getting a sugar daddy because I think sometimes, and you know, I'm kidding, but I'm also not kidding because I think sometimes academics create less harm just staying in bed and not turning on their laptops. Mm. So that's where I am. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I love this idea of the commons, but not yet, or the commons to come. And part of the reason that I, I love how you're talking about it, Denise, and how you're talking about it, Shaista, is that we're all implicated, you know, but we're, we have completely different histories and um, uh, points of attachment and capacities because of the distributions of social relations of oppression and benefit. And so, so it's really vital that we never have a sort of narrative that's like, this is, we're all here together because we're not right at all. And, but there can be these ways that when we're um, having some kind of shared strategic aim, then we can access it from however we're situated and it's gonna be different, right? So like, um, so what that means is I think we do need to be burning the institution down, but if we're just, if we're not just gonna be like constantly as faculty members who are teaching people, if we're not just gonna be constantly saying, I'm a terrible person for even being here and accepting my paycheck, you shouldn't be here learning from me, go do something else. Like if we're gonna really sort of like own, this is actually what I'm doing with my life. Um, then it's like, okay, how do I do this with some capacity to feel that I'm burning down what needs to be burnt down and I'm building what I can build. 
as I burn. Um, so like, I really do take seriously this sort of, I think about Gustav Landar, who was an anarchist who said, you know, the state is a relation and we destroy it by contracting different relations. And that's like specific, right? So it's like it, it, a theory of change that we can do something with is partially like, how do I orient toward a commons that absolutely does not exist yet, but that I can work on because of the way that I am differentially implicated, like because of the way that I benefit from colonialism and white supremacy, like that is part of how I can take responsibility for doing something else if I'm going to stay here and do this work. So that's like, how do I relate with students? You know, how do I set up syllabi? How do I, how do I answer emails? How do I serve on committees, right? Like there, the stuff that we do makes little bits of difference. Um, but we don't want to just sort of randomly do it. Like I, I think having that sense of like, what would it mean for there to be a collectivity that does not erase difference and pretend that just like there's not not even a conversation to have, right? Um, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, are you are you two feeling like there is anything to build, or do you think we should just be? Uh, I don't. I don't know what it means to imagine a world that you just destroy without yeah. without creating. Like to me, they are. They have to go hand in hand and unless they don't <laughs> but it seems to me like that 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 that's a necessary thing like even in your destruction is a creation of something it, the in the challenge is, is can it be a creation of something better more fulfilling mm -hmm. more peaceful more equitable you know mm -hmm. more loving um more just and I think that's where the hard work is, especially inside inside the institution, which is a reflection of everything that's going on in the world. It, it's no special exception um, to anything, which makes the problem even more, you know, complex and um, uh, significant. But I know I share this, you know, feeling of like, <gasps> can we? you know, that takes my breath away. Can we do anything? Um, um, but I don't know. I'm a big, uh, um, my, like just rooted in my thinking and my being is, is the work of James and Grace Lee Boggs, which, mm -hmm. you know, in the, which is knowing in the longest view that every evolution needs a revolution and that every revolution requires an evolution. And so, yeah. you know, in, in I'm just calling on Sylvia Winter in the way that I feel like she's telling us, we write ourselves into existence. We wrote the story of the world and projected it onto the institutions and then forgot we did that. Mm -hmm. Like, that like forgot that we, we can actually change the story or change the narrative. So I'm also curious about that, you know, at the same time that we're, it's important to hold up and call out the evil, the wrongness, the injustice, the trauma, the tragedy. I'm also wondering uh, it, how important it also is to call out the what if, mm. what if, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, what if, you know, something we did actually made a difference? What if something, you know, we um, shared actually uh, made a difference? And so I, because to me, we're, can, can we rewrite the world mm -hmm. in only one register? And mm -hmm. I, I think it has to happen in, in, in these multiple registers and in the way that we might reimagine uh, uh, a different world also requires us to write into the what if and into not what should happen, but what could happen mm -hmm. if we actually loved each other. <laughs> like what could happen mm -hmm. if, um, you know, we we actually cared. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't know, this is what I say to myself in the morning <laughs> because some mornings I wake up and I was like, oh, it's going to be a fight to the death, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's going to be blood and you know, sweat and tears and 
in the residual effects constantly of all these things. Mm -hmm. And then other mornings, I know I have to move. Like, what else am I going to do? I have to put a foot on the ground and I got to, and I got to, and I got to do the next best thing before mm-hmm. I find myself back in, in ruminating on, um, in feeling everything that's not right. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Can I, can I just say one, one thing, you know, the whole thing about my talk is as well, like, I think we also need to, um, you know, not reimagine what is the word I'm looking for, not replace either, but we have to be open to understanding oppression through other categories as well, like, you know, race. I often say that, you know, I say to my students that we have to think about the world of concepts and their lives. And, you know, when we think they've run out of their, you know, productivity in terms of like an anti-capitalist way, we have to do away with them. And I think, you know, in, in terms of thinking with race, I'm not saying, of course, that, you know, racial difference, we do away with it, but I think we get more more particular, more careful about our terminology and think about who is, who remains disposable, even mm-hmm. in terms of our thinking when we when we imagine the world as racially divided, which it is. And so, yeah, I'll stop there. I think it's time. So. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patel, Dr. Talia Farrow Basil, and Dr. Shotwell for this conversation, for really challenging us to think hard about the kind of work we think we're doing in the university, the kinds of harms we might be doing, and the real possibilities and real limitations for making the university into a more liberatory space. Um, I'll invite our respondents to join us now, um, and I'd like to introduce them. So we have uh, Dr. Veronica Finn Bruhi, Assistant Professor in Legal Studies. Hi, Veronica. Uh, We have Dr. Janelle Baker, Assistant Professor Anthropology, and Dr. Melissa Jay, Assistant Professor Human Services. And uh, it's so lovely to see you all there. Um, We'll hear from Dr. Finbury first. She'll be responding to Dr. Taliaferro Basil. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Suzanne, Tobias, Katie. and Melissa as well, I think Melissa is involved in, you know, planning stuff somehow. So I'm really humble and I'm quite opportune at this moment to be given a platform, at least to ask a question to Denise. Before I ask my question, I just um, wanted to say also thank you to all of you. Um, it's just really refreshing to listen to you. Um, I grew up in a very religious household with a single mother, of course. Uh, my mom is a, 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 an epitome of colonization. I love my mother, but she loves the church as well. So we didn't grow up swearing, <laughs> but it was just honestly refreshing. And I think uh, coming to this stage in my life, I have also adopted that um, using swearing to just... Uh, ease my soul I mean in a dime minute while we're preparing for this session I just literally encounter the same bullshit and the same fucked up stuff at the university with discrimination and white fragility and uh, racism and you know I was really upset I nearly didn't want to come to this session right now because it was just literally half an hour before the session. And then I said to myself, you know what? I would definitely attend. I will, because I'm almost, you know, hyped up and ready to listen to these wonderful ladies give this amazing presentation. I'm glad I did, but I'm just going to use my husband as a sounding board. And then, you know what? I would just fuck them up too. And I did. And I just came to the session. I'm like, whatever. So thank you for um, amazing, amazing presentation. I mean, I read uh, Denise's papers and they were just so like, I, you know, I sent her a direct message telling her how the resonance and the reparations that I get from your paper is just, it was just so heartwarming. I was like, yeah, there are people in the world who think like me, so I'm not stupid. Uh, there's nothing wrong with me. So it was just really honestly honorable to to see your work and, and see it written down on a piece of paper. I, I've highlighted a lot of stuff here on my computer. I have written notes and stuff within it, but I'm just going to ask you the one question as I've been required to do. So my question is, in what way or ways 
to you to your commitment to practicing an engaged pedagogy manifest actively in the classroom and could you please elaborate with an example thank you thank you and thank you i haven't read my email yet but i'm really excited to look at it so i really really appreciate it because i think in this work that you know the other thing that we're in fooled into believing a lot is that courage and agency is our individual things and i really think they're collective um dynamics and so i cannot be i cannot do the you know moving against the grain that i do without knowing that there are comrades and comadres y compadres out there who are like in the struggle um 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 you know with me so um so I am, I am so, so disruptive <laughs> in the classroom. And I would say I have always been, um, but lately I feel like uh, with everything going on and with, it, you know, um, even less concern about, um, you know, what people will think uh, uh, about me. Uh, I stay focused on the students and I try not to listen to all the other noise um, uh, around me. And I'm always disruptive in the classroom because to me, the classroom is so, it is like, um, we talk a lot about, you know, the problems in our research, but there are also so many problems in the teaching and in, in the whole idea of and the structure and the way that we have, you know, sort of mapped out what good teaching looks like in uh, in academia. And so, you know, to me, it, it's first of all, I'll, I'll, let me just give you an example of one, one course. Um, well, I have to say this. I do a lot of radical and disruptive things, including, you know, not grading papers, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, obviously, you know, pushing discussion, bringing lots of different kinds of sources in the classroom and trying not to be afraid of bringing all those things I disagree with also into the space of the classroom because at my the bottom of my heart, I believe if I'm going, I'm going to lay this shit here and I'm going to lay it here and you're going to see, I'm not going to have to, you know, uh, um, you know, convince you without you know, putting all the materials on the table. And so, um, so I feel pretty, uh, you know, confident about that. And, and I try to be really excited and um, I try to come, I try to bring the same passion to my classroom that I, you know, bring to, to, you know, all of, all of my activist work. And I do believe my classroom is, 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 I am being an activist um, on purpose and intentionally, you know, in in um, in the classroom space. And so, you know, back when we were at the height of all of this, um, the uprising. Well, actually, this was before the uprisings. So maybe we were in the in the midst of uh, the crisis in Ferguson in the uh, with uh, Michael Brown and. The beginning talks of defunding the police, and um, I decided to turn the curriculum class into uh, what is curriculum theory when Black Lives Matter. And so, uh, I everything, every reading in the class was um, by Black people or people who I call who often get sort of referred to as blackened in the Western consciousness of blackness. And, you know, I I had, I mean, I've always had a lot in my syllabus, but I don't think I've done a syllabus that has been completely um, uh, in that way. And so I, I had to ch challenge myself because I knew I was going to hear a lot of noise about it. And, and I did, but I didn't care. And <laughs> it was a great class. And what I had them do outside of class is write all the traditional things that we didn't do in this class. 
and they and put that away because you'll you'll need that somewhere else, but we're not doing it uh, in here. So, you know, that's just one of the things, um, uh, small things, but I, I try to challenge myself every semester to get a little less in, in alignment with what I should be doing. Thank you so much for that question and for that answer. Um, I'll now um, ask Janelle to say a few words. Thanks, Suzanne. It's such an honor to be included today. Uh, Professor Shotwell, in, um, you write about food uh, being a relation rather than a thing. And I would plan to ask you more about uh, the connections between extraction and consumption and then grappling with food being a relation. But after hearing you speak today, I'd, I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about food being a relation in terms of uh, slow food and being a slow professor, you know, and when, when you speak about kind of the overburden workload and over involvement that that um, we can be prone to. Um, I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit about, you know, how do we teach about say environmental issues and food systems without living them and en enacting them um, in our lives, or by enacting them in our lives. Yeah, that's a really um, beautiful and complicated question. And um, I'm sort of a little bit tempted here to, um, I know that Alyssa was here for a little while, Brock, who's there, and I just would like Alyssa to talk about this. Um, I started talking about food um, as a relation in part because I um, uh, began to feel really concerned about the ways that when settlers who are interested in doing anti-colonial work turn to indigenous um, life ways, spiritualities, modes of life, um, there's a, a turn toward a particular kind of extractivism and a consumption of those life ways, those modes, as though the only way to be in good relation with the world is to continue the process of settlerdom and in place ourselves into indigenous um, subjectivities around notably food. So this happens a lot when um, settlers say like, oh, you know, I'm eating this burger, but it's fine because indigenous people thank the deer for sacrificing her life, you know? And it's like, there's just so much wrong with everything that you just said, you know, like every single part of it. Um, so having to really think about, and this is something also that I, I take, you know, really seriously in listening um, to Eve Tuck and to others about like, what does it look like for us to actually place everything we're doing in a way that takes seriously the history that produces us and where we um, use how we're positioned to change the world. So for me, I think a lot about that in terms of pedagogy. And often when we're talking about the sort of concept of slow professordom it is in terms of um, research work. Uh, but I really loved, Denise, what you were saying, um, because I'm really interested in how we be slow uh, and fast mm -hmm. and at a pace that is not dictated by the university in our teaching um, and in how we think about what it means to learn, which sometimes takes a lot of time and sometimes happens very fast. And if we only have classroom structures that are set up to be like, um, you know, a fast food meal produced on a, on a timeline, you know, produce this, eat this, you know, we don't, we can't um, vary pace. So I don't think it's actually just about slowness. I also think it's about how do we allow people, how do we allow a context in our classes where people can make these kind of leaps, you know, which sometimes are so blinding that they just, they're so brilliant students can, can find these new avenues, right? It's gorgeous. So, so I guess actually like, although I'm really, I'm into the slowing research part of this, I, I want us also to be just like thinking about what it looks like to have a politics of time that resists industrialization. So in the extractivism paper, you know, one of the things that changed me was just really being like, oh, grading came about at the same time as grading and standardizing eggs and meat, right? Like our, 
you know, our A grades are like the A grade egg. Um, so how do we fundamentally change that so that there's a possibility for variation and, um, and different cadences for us and our students? Um, so maybe I'm not so, maybe I'm, maybe there's a different thing than slow food, uh, but that is like situated food, emplaced food, food that takes seriously who we are and what we're eating and that it's never going to be perfect. And yeah, I did not answer oh, well, the question at all. But. I love the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, I'll ask Dr. Melissa J um, to speak to Dr. Patel. Thank you all for having me. It is an honor to be here. And while I'm not part of the planning, I'm so grateful to be a supporter of this work. And I am just really excited, Dr. Patel, to be able to talk with you. I feel like I got to know you while reading this, this powerful, this powerful piece that really does need to be published. So I, I just want to say thank you for sharing the context of how difficult it has been to have it published and I'm like, I want to be a supporter and in, in having it published because it's profound. And so what I was thinking is I would love to read a couple excerpts from it, if that would be okay with you and then um, circle back to what my question was. Does that feel okay? Okay. So I, I also want to situate myself. I'm, um, I'm an indigenous scholar. I'm a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. And I'm also a psychologist, so I, I have a lot of privilege <laughs> by way of being in the, the institution, but also know that um, being in the institution with a marginalized identity requires a lot of emotional labor. And that's how I was reading your work and how I've been listening to each of you today. And I'm really grateful for each of you sharing your hearts and your spirit through your work. So this is from your manuscript. I suggested to Daya that we write about our complicity in white settler colonialism while considering our differential caste positions within the context of white supremacy. We cannot write about complicity together even while centering caste power. This collaboration has been very difficult for me despite a great level of comfort and friendship between us. Initially, I could not articulate the difficulty to her and express my discomfort through going very quiet, something unusual for me or I expressed it unwittingly through my failure to meet up to talk through things which needed to be done for writing this paper. I now know that going quiet in meetings with her was not a lack of feeling, but a rerouting of feelings that one fears will not be understood by another person. So my question to you is knowing the amount of emotional labor that goes into your work and into showing up every day to write in about these things that are so inherent to who you are. I wanted to talk about how you balance um, showing up and doing the hard work, the, the really difficult advocacy that is required of showing up in, in the institution and how you balance it with with caring for yourself in community and allowing yourself to show up so that you can infuse heart and spirit into your work because it is so felt. Lisa, I, I thank you at the beginning of my talk, but I just want to thank you again because I'm I'm so glad that you know you read my paper and I it, it is an honor for me that you read my paper. So thank you so much. Mine and, and the other Costa's paper. Um, you know, I just want to say that. In uh, based on stats from either 2020 or 2021, the lifespan of, of Dalit women is 39 years. So I'm not saying that you know that is my lifespan, but what I'm saying is that you know on average, you know, of course, education, having uh, Canadian citizenship, all of the, those things have made a difference in in terms of my longevity or how much longer I might live past 39. But this is, I mean, what I'm saying is that. The, the trauma is the trauma is so deep and it's so heavy and uh, you know the ways in which the university threatens us and that's a word I'm using very carefully threatens some of us through emails through launching complaints against us through um, you know even monitoring our Twitter it's like we have no space to do anything um, 
I also talked about the the Brahmin patronage and Dalit death in that paper. And, you know, I would say that Bia is my only Brahmin friend um, that, you know, I've made over the years who has stayed my friend despite all of these things. And, you know, just the gratitude that's there. So on an interpersonal level, I love her. I'm going to see her tomorrow. I'm very excited about it at this conference. But yet, you know, yet I, I very easily place her across the barricades. You know, I've said this to her that when our homes are burnt, your people will be roasting marshmallows in that in that fire from, you know, that would be burning our flesh in our homes. I, I don't have an easy answer. I mean, I do watch a lot of TV. So, you know, uh, Game of Thrones, House of Dragons, like it's it's just, you know, and I joke about it, but it's also the only way, um, you know, to survive because even going into community spaces, then there's homophobia, there is classism, there is casteism. So I haven't been able to find that community or Islamophobia, you know, so I haven't been able to find that community. I don't know how I show up to work, but, you know, you got to pay your bills. And so capitalism, I think, gets me out of my bed and, and that's how I show up. But yeah, thank you for asking that, that question. for that really honest question and answer. Um, we have a few minutes left. If uh, there's questions in the audience, uh, we'd ask that you type them in the chat box, which should be available shortly. Um, and myself or Katie uh, will read them out loud. Okay, thank you very much first of all for, uh, for this wonderful conversation. The provocations are very, very important for us. Um, and so I was, I was thinking uh, when you were talking about the slow in research, uh, you know, I am a scholar uh, on the left um, and, and I, I am uh, now receiving a salary from my university, which I don't feel guilt about it. Actually, I feel thankful because before of that, I was about to leave homeless. So it's a, it's a, and I think when I do a job, I, I try to do it well. And so I do it as if I was a mechanic, I would do a good job in mechanics and I do an academic now and try to do a good job. So. But my question is 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 about my is linked to my politics. Um, and sorry, I don't I a lower hand. Uh, and so my my question is about this. Um, the 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 I try to think as an Antonio Gramsci. We are in a political field because I'm on the left. And I do my job from there. That's my positionality. I want a world uh, of equality, a happy world, respect life. Uh, uh, that yeah, appreciates life, uh, uh, that uh, you know, eliminate oppression and racism, domination in all its forms, and, and so I, I think about politics as we are in a in a political field. We have to advance our positions. Uh, 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 you know, in, we have to win, win the cultural battle, as as as, as Antonio Gramsci would say it. Because I'm a pacifist as well, and so, but the far is 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 growing, is gaining terrain around the world, and they are doing it by telling lies, uh, fake news, and by uh, dismissing the authority of knowledge in science and universities. How I ask myself in that context in which the right is, you know, is spreading uh, lies and and dismissing my our work as scholars, uh, is lowering research can help to win the cultural battle. It is not a moment in which we have to proliferate the truth. Uh, uh, it's just a question. Uh, I, I, I experienced that. Now, universities across, across uh, Canada and North America, I think have different experiences. I think uh, I was just uh, last week in a meeting in, in, in Chile. There were a lot of scholars from the United States and from Europe, particularly people from the United States were very stressed out. Uh, because of the job situation, eh? the, you know, the tenure stuff, and you haven't done it, and then people looking around and steal stuff. I didn't feel that in Athabasca, despite our university is very precarious, particularly now that there is a battle with the, the Albertan government, right? And so, uh, and so I said, you know, actually, it's my research process is very slow at Athabasca because it takes a lot of time to just, you know, uh, uh, the expenses stuff, and and so uh, I was. Uh, interested also in, in learning about my colleagues' experience in terms of just loneliness and research and how do they see that from uh, a university like ours, which is, is a different one. And, and just like that, just I wanted to mention that. Thank you. But thank you very much for your thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I would just say just something small here because I, I do think it's this very complicated what's going on right now and very disturbing. But I would also say that while research is important, it's not magic. And I, I say that because I think, you know, working from the space of academia and thinking about research, we so emphatically believe <laughs> that our research um, or our truth telling will solve the problems <laughs> that are out there. And I think that's what's in question. It is the way we have defined research uh, and the way that we have in that process often completely ignored perception, perspective, uh, feelings, opinions <laughs> that have us so entirely out of whack right now in this idea that it's the people over there feeling all of this stuff. And then the people over here who know because we've done um, X, Y, and Z research. And so I think that, that, that that's the thing we need to trouble is that sort of polemic um, uh, there. And, and it's a scary, it's a very scary time <laughs> to, uh, you know, to trouble both ends of that. And so I do think, I mean, I find myself completely disturbed by some of the things that are, you know, going around in the sort of fake news and it being generated from, you know, the, you, you know, this idea that there, there is no, um, you know, evidence or data that is sacred. Uh, and it, it, at the same time, it's, it, it, it's scary. I think it's saying something, not just about people who don't use the data, but it is saying something also about those of us who do in, uh, in, in, in the important uh, self-reflecting that we need to do about what's been limiting about the way we've been doing it in academia and how come it can't speak <laughs> to, uh, you know, um, you know, in ways that mitigate or stop the nonsense out there. Thank you. I think we have a question from Dr. Josie Auger as well. Tanse, hello. I'm working in Treaty 6 area here in Edmonton. And I was listening to your conversation and the courage and the bravery that you exude with uh, your activism. I wanted you to think about um, or think about uh, how you would be able to address the fear of accountability. The fear of accountability for people who have harmed, um, who have wronged, or who have hurt. And, um, and if you could, um, I guess in your specific context, but also with respect to anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism Um, I guess like sometimes like I'm thinking of uh, how do we acknowledge that? How do we move that? Because uh, we think about um, the activism that is happening, the courage that it takes to go through it, the opportunities uh, for social change, um, you know, calling it out. But but also like on the other side of it, there's people who are afraid of accountability that want to keep things as the status quo. So how do you how do you address that? How do you address the fear of people being accountable? So maybe I'll say one thing. Um, I've been working on a, um, I've been working on this thing that I'm thinking of as claiming bad kin, um, which partially comes from Kim Talbert's work about um, identity being a poor substitute for relations and about settler settlerdom as a violation of relation as it, at its base. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what does it look like for white people and white settlers to claim the people who are terrified of accountability? And I think that a lot of the time what that means is for me to recognize the way that I and other white people in the academy are beneficiaries of their fear of accountability, their, the way that shielding themselves also shields me, um, and making collective cause to oppose them and to participate in, in the work of accountability. So 
so I think that can't be the sort of like individual, like, oh, I, I'm, you know, the sort of self-flagellating move that is so tiring and boring. It has to be something that's actually um, collective, that has a politics, right? That is um, articulated and that is in allegiance with actual people who are engaged in actual struggle. And then from there, using the positions that, that we settler white people have to um, participate in that, in naming enemies and opposing them, um, which also is part of the, the work uh, that Eloy is talking about, like to do a good job in these jobs right now means being re real. And I think also, you know, thinking about Shaista's work, right? Like what does it mean to not be able to be complicit together? Um, so being situated, but then having a politics and making, taking a stake, you know? So I, I think a lot about like, what does that fear of accountability, how does that benefit white people? And then how do white people in the academy need to um, step into responsibility? Thank you. Hmm. Well, I think, I think a lot about, I'm trying so hard not to worry about other people <laughs> and what, you know, you know, like I have a neighbor who's just as nice as she can be, but we do not share politics at all. And sometimes, you know, she comes outside and she's like, hey, Denise, you know, what do you think about, you know, that, 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 that. And I'm like, mm, Kathy, girl, your grass is beautiful. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> because I just know no part of me can have this conversation uh, uh, anymore. And um you know, so I, I want to be example, an example of trying to take accountability for where I think, you know, I can be a better person, you know, a better, uh, in better relation um, with uh, myself, with the, with the world, with, you know, the animals, with, with, you know, people who are willing to be in better relation and that that clearly comes with understanding that there are people who don't um who are who whose main concern is about power um maintaining power being power or being powerful and so like whether um, it's even victim perpetrator or a witness right yes 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 exactly and so you know i um I don't know. I feel like these days I don't draw very many conclusions. I make decisions. <laughs> I make decisions. At least you can make decisions. <laughs> yeah. I try to make decisions in the, you know, in the moments that come to me, you know, and try to make them in thoughtful ways. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think this is similar to the first question that was asked, this whole idea that we can, um, outside of changing ourselves in relation to other people that we can do something <laughs> to change the how do we see these as opportunities right yeah. yeah so thank you well thank you all so much we are already over time and there are more questions in the chat and there's hands raised which i think really speaks to just how dynamic and engaging and interesting and inspiring this conversation was. Um, so I want to thank our three speakers, Dr. Shotwell, Patel, and Tali Ferro Basil, as well as our respondents um, from AU. We're so grateful you were here and um, so grateful for this conversation. Me too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.